Alan, by the way, I was so caught up in my enthusiasm to see Alan. Alan was the editor, is the editor of that book, so he is the person who is making it happen. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. It was a piece of cake editing it, because uh, the, the, all the authors were great. I, I'm, I'm here to actually uh, introduce uh, Bob Carter uh, for an award, but first of all, I want to just, uh, 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 by way of a, something of a requiem, talk about Ray Evans, who many of you would know. He died, he passed away earlier this year. Ray, within Australia, was a fantastic networker in addressing the Leviathan in all its forms, the same sort of thing that, that uh, Heartland does. Uh, and his particular niche within this was to, to uh, get together people into societies which interests them. He formed a society on industrial relations. We have a particularly uh, person, a pernicious form of industrial relations law in Australia which leaves law courts uh, in a very high high uh, position to, to specify wages, etc. He did that. He also did something to try to roll back the erosion of the constitutional uh, liberties that, that you know, were, were first evolved by John Locke and then, then taken a little bit further by those, those traitors to King George, good, good King George, uh, over in this, this part of, the, of, the, of this continent. Uh, and, and, and gradually they're being rolled back by legislatures, or more particularly by executives and by the courts themselves. But more than anything, I think, from this perspective, he formed a, uh, something called the Lavoisier Society, and it was founded to pursue you know, truth and, and purity in science, uh, and it gave a network, it gave a focus to a great many people uh, in, in science who, who were almost voiceless, and he gave them a platform, and it allowed them to, to uh, make their views held and to contest the ground which was falling away into political correctness. Uh, not only did it do, of course, this for the Antipodeans in uh, New Zealand and Australia, but he's also provided a, pl a platform for many people, uh, people including people here, uh, who, uh, who uh, w w were invited over and hosted by Ray. People like Chris Monkton, uh, Fred Singer, John Christie, uh, Richard Linson, Ross McIntrick, and Pat Michaels. So, uh, bail Ray Evans, and he did a great job there. Now, Bob Carter is very much alive. Uh, and he's amongst the, he was amongst the most prolific of the contributors and is still to the Lavoisier group. Uh, Bob started life as a paleontologist, but as a result of having principles, didn't follow his counterpart, his famous counterpart in Australia in that field, Tim Flannery, into a government that provided affluence. Bob just couldn't bring himself to say that the rivers will dry up and that the seas will boil. Bob instead pursued steady research, culminating in, in academia, uh, as professor and head of the School of Earth Sciences at James Cook University. Uh, he first, I first met him when he was contesting issues about the Great Barrier Reef. In those days, the green groups were saying uh, agricultural runoff will, will undermine the reef, and Bob was steadily pr producing material which demonstrated that wasn't the case. Of course, they found, uh, found in the end a much more potent uh, means of, of, uh, of attacking uh, uh, society and, and promote, using the reef to do so in greenhouse gas emissions and they're claiming, of course, that the reef will disappear. And, then, and Bob uh, is very much at the forefront in contesting those sorts of claims. Uh, as well as having produced uh, dozens of articles, uh, Bob's authored at least two major books, one of which was called Taxing Air, and it actually became a, a bestseller. Partly, not, not only was it a very good book, but partly it became a bestseller because Bob quite uh, cleverly recruited a very gifted cartoonist, John Spooner, Australian cartoonist, as a fellow author, and so it did attract uh, quite a lot of attention. Uh, and and in, in attracting that attention, um, the, the, it, it, it brought people to examine Bob's credentials, and I guess one of the ultimate accolades that Bob was paid uh, by a, a green academic, a man called Ian Enting, uh, who criticised this book, and he, thought, he said it was, quote, a series of half-truths and slanted misrepresentation, unquote. Enting's own claim to fame uh, is a book which he wrote uh, called Twisted, the Distorted Mathematics of Greenhouse Denial. So he was clearly on that side of the, of the road. Bob's, uh, Bob's success, though, with the book led, led to the, the search 
on the part of the, the usual sort of search, on the part of the, the green group people into these confettis of, of, of dollars being showered on him. And they, they found uh, such a sort in the end, uh, a notorious Midwest institution that paid him for a period uh, $1,667 per month uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of work, the research work he was doing, yes, that, that institution was Heartland. Uh, Bob got exactly about 7%, I think, uh, of the, the flannery rate in terms of, of, of remuneration. And what, what Bob's detractors didn't realise uh, was that he was willing and, and able to crisscross the country in Australia giving talks uh, just for the price of an airfare, uh, such was his dedication. Uh, Bob's uh, careful scholarship and, and, and vast energy uh, has made, made him the, the natural choice for me to, uh, to, to, for, for the book uh, Climate Change, The Facts, as uh, uh, one of the original authors and, and certainly an advisor in finding other authors. And uh, Bob, Bob was very helpful in that and in terms of ironing out some of the more difficult uh, scientific statements which, were, which, were, which authors naturally wanted to put in but which may, would have made the book somewhat less readable. So it's uh, really an honour to introduce Bob for this award. Uh, I do note that lifetime achievements in Oscars generally go to people who've acted uh, in a lot of roles and the Academy finally says, well, it recognises uh, the, the actor uh, for, for the achievement. John Wayne comes into mind. Uh, but Bob, uh, Bob is not about to ride into the sunset. He continues to do original research in order, largely, to finance his vocation of combating the politicised science that dominates universities. And uh, indeed, uh, for, his, for the, his efforts in this, he was shamefully cut off by his, uh, his, his major university, James Cook, uh, once he retired um, from a mix of uh, ideological absolutism on, on the part of that university and uh, plain harlotry in pursuit of, of uh, grants, which uh, they figured that Bob was somewhat uh, as a detractor for, so they cut off his, uh, his modest privileges as an emer emeritus professor. So, but we are recognising his merits today, and uh, it's my great pleasure to recognise and to introduce you, Bob Carter, and most of us know him, fabulous uh, career and a great future. That's the Oscar. Thank you, Alan. That's the first time I've ever been compared to John Wayne, I must say. <laughs> well, thank you, Alan. And, and behind you, thank you, Joe Bast, who's the director of Heartland, obviously, that have conferred this award. I receive this award with great gratitude. Like the other award winners who stood at this podium, my emotions are high as I contemplate the question, why me, in a room that contains so many fine scientists and other professionals, all of whom have worked tirelessly and often brilliantly for our chosen cause and who deserve an award too. Our chosen cause, of course, is the pursuit of truth in science. And beyond that, and just as importantly, honesty in the application of that science to public policy making. The issue of dangerous anthropogenic global warming, the focus of this conference, is but one battlefield in a wide-ranging war of environmental politics that has swept the globe in the last 50 or so years, starting perhaps with the publication of Rachel Carson's famous book, Silent Spring in 1962. Equally, if one, if one were to look for a starting point when the many individual efforts to inform the public more accurately about climate change coalesced into a cohesive and effective opposition to alarmist views, then obviously the first Heartland International Climate Conference held in New York in March 2008 marked that point. 
It's awesome to contemplate the amount of effort and skill that Joe and Diane Bast and their team have put into organizing now 10 such conferences since then. All the while, all the while supporting other related efforts, such as, for example, acting as editors and publishers for the major Fred Singer and Craig Idso driven NIPSI, Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, reports. And most award winners who have stood in this podium are also experienced public speakers. But bearing in mind the premise that a good public talk is always about the subject and never about the speaker, all of us are also momentarily nonplussed by having to deliver a speech in which the subject is, well, in this case, me. A blog posting once asked about me querulously, quote, why would anyone want to listen to the views of an unknown geologist from a second-rate university in a third-rate country, unquote? <laughs> why indeed, and full marks for the plutonium dense invective. But it will surprise none of you that I do take gentle issue with this effusion, for I would perhaps be more accurately if still inelegantly, be defined as a polyglot geologist. Polyglot. Because I was born in England during the Second World War, son of a pharmacist father and a schoolteacher mother, and on the death of my father in 1955, my mother moved to New Zealand so that I'd be near to one of my two elder brothers who was farming there, should anything untoward happen to her. At the time, my other brother was an archaeologist at the National Museum in Ghana, Africa, and I often wondered how life would have turned out for young Robert had the toss of the coin favoured Ghana over New Zealand as a destination. <laughs> Later, in 1981, by now with my wife Anne and two young children, I came to move to tropical North Queensland, Australia, where our family has been contentedly based ever since. In between emigrating to New Zealand in 1955 and moving to Australia in 1981, my education had been provided at boarding schools, first in England and then in New Zealand. Uh, if Mark stains here, uh, in Hawke's Bay, Mark. <laughs> After which I completed a degree in geology at Otago University, uh, New Zealand's oldest university located in Dunedin. Exciting professional opportunities immediately opened up with participation in a 1964 archaeological investigation into Pitcairn Island and into the pre-Bounty inhabitants, because when the Bounty mutineers arrived there, they found the remains of Polynesian activity, hearths and uh, artifacts and so on, but the island was deserted. And so the object of this expedition was to uncover ev evidence about the pre-Bounty Polynesian occupations. It was a wonderful uh, opportunity for a young geologist. I travelled back to England in 1965 to undertake a PhD in Cambridge University, as Alan has said, in paleontology or fossils, uh, and followed that with a memorable four-month driving trip, leaving from London in uh, January, the middle of winter, and, and listen carefully, through France, Spain, across to North Africa, back to Italy, Greece, Turkey, through Iran, and to Pakistan an expedition that somehow came to be supported by my new employer, which was again at Target University, on the grounds that I was collecting fossils for the university's reference collection. I think this is the first example in my career uh, that my uh, loquacity uh, did deliver some rewards. I can't quite believe that they did that. Well, those were the days, and not least because political instability now makes such a road trip very hard to undertake safely, if indeed at all. Those were the days, and not le uh, sorry, my career was rounded out by our family move from Dunedin to Townsville in 1981, where I took up the chair of geology at James Cook University and pursued teaching, research, and increasingly with time, science administration through to my retirement at the end of the 20th century. I can fairly be described then as a polyglot geologist on the grounds that not only have I been domiciled in three different countries, but I've also been privileged to undertake research as a geologist in more than 30 more. That said, 
Regarding the activity in the global warming war that we're all here to participate in, I am but a Johnny come lately. For I did not write my first public article critical of environmental issues, and it happened to be on the Great Barrier Reef, until 2002, a little after my retirement from teaching. Given that my website now lists more than 250 articles and speeches uh, that followed the initial Great Barrier Reef article, most of which are on climate change, I suppose I might perhaps compete for a prize in persistence. But in fact, I am literally in awe as I contemplate the fact that some of the scientific heroes among us, including, for example, Sherwood Idso, Bill Gray, and Tim Ball, have been fighting the poisonous global warming propaganda war ever since the formation of the IPCC in 1988. In other words, they've been at it for at least 10 years longer than I have, and I salute them breathlessly. In finishing, I must, of course, thank Joe and Diane Bast again, not only for this special award, but also on behalf of all of us for the magnificent opportunities that they regularly provide for like-minded persons to gather together to discuss the global warming issue. The Hartland Institute does many fine things, but none is finer than the decisive world leadership that it has provided for the cause of rational discussion in climate change. Second is with great love and gratitude that I acknowledge the nurturing support throughout my career of my gentle wife, Anne. Yeah. It is a particular pleasure to me that she's able to be here today, accompanied by her ever supportive sister, Helen, and Helen's husband, Bill Linquist. Helen and Bill, a biologist and an exploration geologist, are two other doughty warriors for the cause of truth in science and environmental policy making. And Helen and Bill and Anne, please stand up so people can see who you are. Third, and really to conclude this time, I address the following quotation not just to everybody in this room, but also to the thousands of persons around the world who continue to strive to restore common sense to the overheated public discussion on allegedly dangerous global warming. The quotation is actually the dedication from my second book, which uh, has already been referred to kindly by Alan, uh, with co-authors John Spooner, Bill Kinnemont, Brian Leyland, and others. And John Spooner, the cartoonist, was the author of the cartoon that many of you saw this morning uh, of the uh, terrorists in Iran lamenting the fact that they weren't viewed as as big a threat by President Obama as uh, global warming. The quotation goes like this. For the last 20 years, the received scientific wisdom about global warming has been provided to governments by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This book, and today, this award, is dedicated to the army of independent persons and bloggers who, by questioning every precept, analyzing every extravagant claim, and insisting on the importance of empirical evidence, have helped to keep the IPCC honest and the spirit of true scientific inquiry alive. History will salute them. End quote. Alan. Alan, Joe and Diana, who I hope are watching, ladies and gentlemen, and Anne, thank you for your wonderful support and for this honour.